Cool. Are you ready? Yeah, good. Awesome. So can you remember the moment that the idea for Hashcash came about? And if so, did you have any sense of the implications of it moving forwards or? Um, so, yeah, I remember. And, and it was kind of combination. I was reading some uh, Usenet group, I think Psycrypt or something, about a birthday collision on hash functions, which is sort of related to the question of you know, how many people would you have to have in a room at a party until two people would have the same birthday? And, you know, you think there's 365 days in the year, so it would be quite a lot, but actually it's only 23. And so it's a bit counterintuitive, but it's basically because, you know, if you, if you pick one person and then another person and put them in a group, and then you've had a third person, now that third person could collide with either of them. So the probability of finding a collision is increasing as you go. Mm. And... So for hash functions, the, the number of permutations is much larger, you know, sort of two to the 160, like 160 bit hash function. But nevertheless, the, the amount of work to find a collision, like a birthday collision, i.e. two pieces of data to when hashed that result in the same output is two to the 80, which is a lot, you know, massively smaller than two to the 160. And so I thought that was interesting. And it occurred to me that the, if you had you know, it's almost impossible to compute one of those, but if you had it as a kind of trophy, you could instantly convince anybody that it's correct and you've done this stupendous amount of work. Just give them the two inputs, they could hash it and say, wow, it produces the same output. That's proof that you did this enormous amount of work. And then sort of in separately, and you know, like within a few days, I'd been looking at, when I was running a remailer, which is a, a way to have privacy for email and posting on Usenet. And I was, I was one of the operators of those remailer nodes and people were starting to spam through it and it's kind of a nuisance. And normally how people deal with spam is they block IP addresses, they block email addresses. And because it's anonymous by definition, you couldn't do that. And so I was like, well, like what, what else could you do? Just brainstorming about it. Well, you could charge people like if there was an electronic cash system, but there was no electronic cash system. Credit card processing is pretty difficult. There was no PayPal, and a lot of people don't have credit cards. And so then I sort of reduced the problem to say, well, maybe if you can't pay people, we could at least introduce a cost. Because the problem is it's free to send emails. So it makes spam possible, even with a low success rate. And so then that occurred to me, well, that the hash collision is a kind of solution, but you need smaller amounts of work. So then I, that's then uh, kind of an applied cryptography problem. How do you adjust that problem to make it possible to create smaller amounts of work? And so I like, you know, played with different variants of that and concluded that you could make a sort of partial hash collision that you could change the amount of work easily. And so, and I implemented it and posted the description. This is in uh, 1997 and almost immediately People uh, drew a connection to the um, uh, digital cash, electronic cash idea that, that, you know, this is a bit like digital gold. And so it got people started, you know, within a matter of days thinking about, you know, while it would hyperinflate, how could we control inflation? And that actually was a difficult thing to solve. And then there's also, you know, you want it to be decentralized. And so people were talking about, um, you know, broadcasting the transaction. So like a rough design idea, similar to Bitcoin in, in an outline. And by 98, Weidai proposed B-Money and Nick Sabo proposed Bitgold. So, you know, the connection to electronic cash seems to occur to lots of people at the same time, but how to actually implement it is more difficult. Mm -hmm. And I'd say that Bitgold and B-Money weren't quite implementable because they involved quite a bit of human uh, intervention or management or judgment. Um, and I think another reason that it was interesting to use proof of work to bring coins into existence is that the previous electronic cash system that had failed you know, recently, before, a few years before that, Digicash, which is based in the Netherlands at the time, um, is that they were kind of like what we would call stable coins today. So they're expecting a relationship with a bank, which was hard to achieve and maybe not very stable once you've got it. And that company had failed because it was centralized. And so there's also a realization that if you could use proof of work and mining of fresh coins to bring coins into the to bring value into the system, then you wouldn't need to work with a bank. And the, and the, you know, 
exchange of the coins for fiat currencies could be done uh, sort of separately. Mm. You know, there could be multiple competing. It's, it's not part of the central system. There's no centralized entity running it. Um, so yeah, it was like the realization that it could be relevant was pretty immediate. It seemed to occur to lots of people, but I think Satoshi finally solved some of the remaining problems around inflation control um, and fully automating the, the system so it didn't involve humans or any knowledge about mm. price outside the system. Cool. So that leads on to when you first read the white paper, what were your honest first thoughts? Well, I mean, my first thoughts were that it was not very private. And this is, you know, because the previous electronic cash systems, while they were centralized, were you know, very, had a, provided a very high degree of privacy without needing to trust an intermediary. And so that was the kind of idealized expectation amongst people working on those things of how an electronic cash system should look. And Bitcoin didn't look like it because it didn't have very strong privacy. It has some privacy, but mm. you know, still linkable to some extent, pseudonymous. So that was one critique that you know seemed to be a common response from cryptographers. And um, another critique was the security levels. So with the centralized electronic cash systems, as long as you trust the centralized entity, which is a kind of big assumption actually. Mm. Um, then it would, you know, there's an enormous amount advantage for the defender. So if somebody to attack it, they'd have to, you know, brute force a key that would be almost impossible amount of uh, com computation. And Bitcoin used a kind of more game theory 50-50 where, you know, you need the honest participants to outweigh the attackers in a, mm. the kind of hash rate war. Now, I mean, of course, once people came to understand it more, including myself, it, it became evident that, you know, actually you could lose money attacking it if you weren't careful. And so it's not quite as attackable as you'd think because you can't just attack it. You have to spend a lot of money attacking it. And if it's more profitable to not attack it mm. but to participate, then maybe you'll do that instead. But it took people a while to realize that. And so you know, those are some of the early reactions. Um, but I did think it was interesting that, you know, Satoshi had solved this um, sort of uh, inflation control uh, problem, which prevented the previous ideas from being implemented. And the remaining question was then, you know, will it will it bootstrap? And you know, I wasn't I wasn't really actively involved until 2013 in like reading a lot more and trying to understand the full details. But you know, right down to the wire protocol and stuff. But um, it was a bit of an open question about whether it would bootstrap. And it, mm. evidently, it took a few years before the first exchange and stuff like that. Mm. Cool, yeah. So I can imagine it all started to piece together in your head then how Ashcash and the sort of developments that you made there could potentially have kick-started, well, the invention of an actual digital money that works. Yeah, I mean, you know, all of the um, related systems like B-Money, Bitgold, RPAL, which was a 2004 system by Hart Finney, mm. uh, centralized but with good privacy, we're using the same mine with Hashcash to create coins mm. concepts. And you know, Bitcoin actually uses the work for additional reasons to provide finality and to uh, deal with race conditions mm. uh, that buys into general problems. So it's really using the work for like three interrelated things. So it's, it's quite a clever, interesting design that mm. was you know, novel and not uh, part of those previous designs. Mm. So. Yeah, like there was a lot of, in the early days, I imagine a lot of um, sort of critiques and stuff. And as time gone on with things like Lightning coming about, like some earlier problems been solved by making trade-offs for other elements of the project. And But despite all that, what would you say the, the biggest threat to Bitcoin is at the moment? Um, I think a lot of threats have receded, like the regulatory risks have receded. There's a lot more, you know, cover from big financial institutions participating in regulators and sort of making some little clarity they're not completely um and i think the technical risks have receded as well because you know the early very early versions of bitcoin apparently had some uh, pretty big bugs but they mm. were fixed and so you know at this point there are 
it seems like there are very few bugs and there's a lot more caution about changes you know, a lot more testing mm -hmm. a lot more review um so I, you know i think the risks have uh, receded and you know like a, a conceptual risk is you know if banks get their act together and go back to a gold standard but i think the banks and, and central banks and banks are not good at competing with bitcoin because mm -hmm. of their own imposed rules mm -hmm. cool um yeah a lot of people tend to say like we've asked this question to a few people so far today and a lot of people think that crypto and altcoins and stuff are posing a potential threat due to just the the public's perception um yeah. so what what would you say your thoughts on on bitcoin maximalism now there was a talk about it yesterday um i'm just curious as to what you think about that yeah i mean i think that you know you can look at innovation separately from speculation and so there are certainly altcoins which have you know innovative experiments in them you know most of them are you know, too high risk or not enough security bar to be adopted by bitcoin but at least they're you know they're trying to add some value um but you know even if there is a feature of a coin that could be useful i don't think that makes the you know the coin itself uh, a rational investment because you know, ultimately those coins are like utility coins effectively right they're a utility coin to buy uh, use you know meters use of a service and if you think about it that technology gets faster networks get faster uh, protocols improve so you know using that as an investment would be like buying you know uh, a prepaid bandwidth voucher for 3G data. You know, I mean, and you know, data has got cheaper by hundreds of times over you know, a period of years. Mm -hmm. So you've got to expect that that will be the case for you know, protocol efficiency and network mm -hmm. bandwidth and storage and stuff. So you know, from that point of view, if you, if you want to use a service, you'd expect to buy the vouchers to use it uh, right before you use it, right? And there's certainly many peer-to-peer -peer protocols that don't have um coins attached to them you know like file sharing applications and things like that only. so it's certainly not necessary so i tend to view it that you know we have an electronic cash for the internet and it's bitcoin and if you want to pay for something there is a utility coin which is bitcoin so use it right mm. and so you know yeah there's because some people get stuck in like claiming that old coins don't have any innovation now probably 99 and a half or something don't in fact because they're mostly clones and there are 10 you know 20 000 plus it grows very quickly so, but I do think that most of the people investing in them know that they are playing in a casino. Like they don't have any illusion that they will invest in it and hold it for the long term because they expect it to go through a hype cycle and then collapse. Because that's mostly what happens, right? I mean, you know, probably 99% of the coins that have ever existed are largely disappeared and, and fallen out of interest. Um, so, you know, it's a free world. If people want to play with the casino, they can do that. But they, the, some of the excesses of it, because there, there is a degree of kind of insider advantage and, you know, outright pyramid schemes and scams that go on in some ICOs, altcoin pre-mines, DeFi projects that are a bit pyramid-like. And, you know, when they fail in a big way, regulators tend to get involved defensively to protect investors. So they do sometimes give crypto in general a bad name mm. or create a mess that regulators feel is so large they have to do something about it yeah. more quickly. So from that point of view, I think it's negative. I mean, in a casino, you know, people are going to play in casinos either way, right? Mm. So, but uh, yeah, as long as the you know, for the participants to understand that, I think it's fine for maybe naive newcomers who believe a misleading altcoin pitch that's not that's not so cool because mm. they may end up holding the bag ultimately mm. cool well i know you've been flooded with bitcoin questions all day so just wanted to ask something a bit different do you have any hobbies outside of bitcoin um well i like kind of uh applied crypto things you know trying to find mm. um uh, sort of cryptographic building blocks <laughs> that do something interesting which is hard to do mm. so i'll keep pegging away trying to uh you know find a solution to something you know obviously those won't be easy or they wouldn't be needing solving and so most mostly you'll fail but you know if you don't try you'll never find a solution so mm. um 
So that's one thing. And I also like um, kind of physical puzzles like Rubik's Cubes and yeah. things like that. Yeah, they're good fun. Awesome. Well, it's been amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you. Cheers.